So here's all the questions that we're going to do, but I'm gonna split the questions up onto individual pages so that we can see um, a little bit better uh, what we need to do. So let's begin. It says sketched below is the graph of f of x. Okay. Um, oh, I don't like it when they put an A over there. Normally A is over there, and that sometimes can confuse learners, so just keep that in mind. Um, the x-intercepts of F are 3, 0, which is there, and M, where M lies on the negative x-axis. The value K is the y-intercept, and then M and N are turning points. Now, first thing I need to tell you, and you've probably heard me say this before, but if you haven't, take some notes on what I'm about to tell you. It's really important. When you have a x-intercept, which is also a turning point, then you need to remember that this counts as two x-intercepts. Two of them, okay? So, yeah, that is important that you understand that, okay? There are two x-intercepts there, not one, okay? So the first question for five marks says, show that the equation of f is given like that. Okay, so remember, I have shown this in previous videos. Whenever you have the x-intercepts, then you can just make three brackets, okay? Um, and then you would usually um, say y equals, okay, I don't know why I squashed that up so ugly like that. Okay, so y equals, and then I'd usually, you always, I always remind you that you need to put an a, um, and then three brackets. But now what is that A actually? It's not that A, and that's why I don't like it when they do it like this. That A is the first one in front of the X3, because this is how they usually write it for us. Uh, it's that A, it's the one in the front of the X3. But in this example, that A is A, that value is a one. So we can drop that. You can put a one if you wanted to. Then if you've seen videos on this before where you have your X-intercepts, um, then you're just gonna make three brackets. So that's a three, so you say x take away three. Then x take away whatever this one's x value is. So let's call that x value of m, and then this one will be exactly the same. Because what did I tell you? I said that when this is a turning point and an x-intercept, it counts as two x-intercepts. Ah, good, very good. So. What we can now do is, and, and by the way, if this was like a five, for example, or like a negative five, then your brackets would go like this. X take away three, X plus five, it would become X plus five and X plus five. Because you could imagine it goes, um, you would go X take away negative five and then X take away negative five. And you see how it ends up becoming a plus. Okay, but we don't need to worry about m being negative or positive. You're just going to go put it like that and the mathematics will work it out. Okay, so what we do now is um, we take this value and we substitute it. So that's a y value, that's an x value. So you plug that into the place of y and then the x is zero and look at that. Beautiful. The only unknown is the x value of m. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say negative 3 equals to, this just becomes negative 3, and then this is just negative xm. Do you agree with me? Negative xm, because 0 take away xm is just negative xm. I'm then going to multiply these two together to become positive, because two negatives make a positive. So that's going to become um, xm squared, positive xm squared. I'm then going to divide uh, this negative 3 onto the left side here. So you're going to end up with negative 3 over negative 3 equals to xm squared. And so xm squared is going to be equal to 1. And then if you had to go work out um, xm, you would say the square root, but you would say plus and minus the square root of 1. And so the x value of m is either plus or minus 1. But from the diagram, we know that m is a negative. And they make that clear to us because some learners might be like, yeah, but how do we know that? Um, m lies on the negative x-axis. So m has the x value of m has to be negative 1. Okay, excellent job, guys. So now we have the x value of m as negative 1. So we can now come back to this step over here. And we can go fill in x as um, the x value of m as negative 1, like that, and like that, negative 1, 
Okay, um, and, and I hope you remember this method, guys. I have shown this in previous videos. So for example, if you have like uh, this, and you have like a negative three here, a one here, and a three here, then you make three brackets, remember? And then normally you have to put a little A in the front, but in this one, um, it was a one, so I left it out. So then for this bracket, you would say X take away negative three. For this bracket, you would say X take away one. And for this bracket, you would say X take away three. And then you would just be able to get your brackets like that, okay? I have shown that many, many times before, so I hope you were aware of that. Now, let's carry on. So I'm gonna leave this one, it's not necessary. So we have X minus three, X plus one, um, and another x plus one. In fact, yeah, that's perfect, that's perfect. Okay, now we just go multiply everything out. So when you have three brackets, you can multiply any two of them together. So I'm gonna multiply the first two together so long. Actually, no, I'm gonna do, it doesn't matter, but I'm gonna do these two together. And then the first one will just stay there. And then you keep it in a bracket. Remember, when you multiply these two, you still keep the answer in a bracket because we still need to use this one. And so if you had to go multiply that, you would eventually get x squared plus 2x plus 1. You might do that in little steps. x squared plus x plus x. That's where I got the 2x from. And then plus 1. Now we need to go multiply these two brackets together. And so I'm going to do that. Whoopsie. Uh, what was that? I'm going to do that up over there. So that's gonna become x times x squared, which is x cubed, uh, plus two x squared, um, plus x, minus three x squared, take away six x, take away three. Then I'm going to put uh, all of the like terms together. So those two, which is negative x squared, and then these two together, which is negative five x, and then negative three. Okay, and let's see, is that what they said? Yes, well done guys, we've done it. Let's move on to the next part. Okay, this question says calculate the coordinates of n. Now that is the turning point. I've got the equation that we worked out previously. So, okay, so we know that to find turning points, um, which are those points over there, it is where the gradient of the graph is equal to zero. So you make, you take the first derivative, which is gonna be three x squared, take away two x, take away five, because remember, first derivative means gradient, and we're gonna make that equal to zero. We don't always make it equal to zero every time we take the first derivative, but when you're finding turning points, then you do make it equal to zero. A lot of learners are in this bad habit of whenever they take the first derivative, they just immediately make it equal to zero, but you need to understand something. The first derivative is another word for gradient, so the gradient is zero at those points and that's why we allowed to make it equal to zero. Okay, now we're just gonna go either factorize this or use the quadratic formula. I'm gonna use the quadratic formula. Um, the x equals to negative b plus minus b squared take away 4ac over 2a. Um, you would have to show them how you fill this in in the exam, but I'm just gonna quickly go get the answers because we all know how to use that formula by now. And so x would be 5 thirds, 5 over 3, or x would be negative 1. Okay, so obviously this one is the m, which is negative 1, which we actually worked out already, um, that this x value is negative 1, and this one would be 5 thirds. So the, the, the x value is 5 thirds. Now, think about carefully. What do we need to find next? We need to find the y value. So does that mean we're gonna plug it into this equation? No, because this is not a y value. This is a gradient. Remember, first derivative means gradient. So we're not gonna plug it into there. If you did, you're just gonna get zero again. And that's not correct. You're gonna plug it into here because this is a y value. So we're gonna say, um, we're gonna go plug in uh, five over three into that point. Okay, and if we work this out, Ooh, ugly number, negative 256 over 27. This next question says that for which values of x will f of x, which is this graph, for which values of x will it be smaller than zero? Now we need to understand what that means because I know a lot of you still struggle with that. They're saying where is the graph smaller than zero? Now what do they mean? Do they mean where are the x values smaller than zero? because that would be all of this. No, they mean where are the y values smaller than zero? So if I highlight the graph here, 
in this area here, tell me about the y values. Are they negative or positive? Well, there the y values are negative um, all the way up to there. All of that, the y values are negative, right? Of course, not that point over there because there the y value is zero. And then as soon as we go past that point, then look at that, the y values all become positive. So where are the y values negative? Well, it would be all of this up to there and then go just skip past that point and then up to there, but don't include that point because at that point and at that point, the y values are zero, but they want to know where are they? Less than zero. So we could say that it's everywhere um, where x is, well, let's first say, if you wanted to use interval notation, you could say x is an element um, going from negative infinity up to this x value, which is negative one, or from negative one up to three, and we don't include any of those points. Okay, does that make sense? The next one, if you wanna use interval notation, you could say that x is um, any number smaller than uh, negative one, okay? That's the same as saying that. X is anything smaller than negative one, or um, X is any number um, that is bigger than minus one, but smaller than three, and that's the same as that part. You even allowed to say that X can be any number that is smaller than three, but just don't let X equal to um, negative one. You could even say that if you wanted to, okay. This question says, for which value of x is the graph increasing? Now, increasing is when the graph is going up, when you're moving from left to right. So it would be all of this up to there, and then it would be all of this. You see, that's increasing. The gradient is positive. You see how the gradient is positive? Okay, if you look at this area, ooh, it's going down. You see how it's going down, so that is not increasing. Now, it's only for two marks, so we definitely don't need to go use calculus and all of that fancy stuff. We can literally just say that it's this area here, so that's everywhere where x is smaller than negative one, because this is negative one. And we're not gonna include the negative one. Some learners still get confused with this. At negative one, is the graph increasing, decreasing, or is it flat? Well, most of you are gonna tell me it's flat. So that's why we don't include negative one because they're not asking us where it's flat. They wanna know where is it increasing. So we'll go all the way up to negative one, but we won't include negative one. Then the next part would be from x is larger than, ah, now remember we worked this x value out earlier and we worked it out as five over three. So x is bigger than five over three. Okay, um, if you want to use interval notation, you could say that x is an element going from um, negative infinity up to negative one, or x is any number um, from five over three up to infinity. And once again, we're not including the five over three because at the five over three, it is not increasing, it is flat. This question says, where will the graph be concave up? So remember, let's talk about concave. Um, when a graph looks like that, does it look sad or does it look happy? Well, maybe if I put the eyes, that's a sad face. So this person is feeling very down. So we call this concave down. What about this person? Oh, this person's really happy, smiling. So we call this, this person's feeling up, you know, like um, the energy's up. So we say concave up. So if you look at this graph, where is it sad, where is it happy? Well, we know that somewhere over here where it's called the inflection point, that's where it changes from sad to happy or happy to sad. So here it's sad, look at that, see the sad face? And then here it's happy, see the smiley face? So they wanna know where is it happy? Well, it's definitely from here, but the problem is we don't know what here is. We don't know what the inflection point is, it's not K. So how do we find inflection point? Well, you should know this by now. To find the inflection point, you take the um, first derivative, I mean the second derivative, sorry, and you make it equal to zero. So we're gonna find the first derivative because you can't get to the second derivative without the first derivative. Wise words, Kevin, wise words. I know, guys, I know. So the second derivative is six x take away two. Make it equal to zero, solve for x, 
divide by 6, and you end up with 2 over 6, which is the same as 1 over 3. So the x value here is 1 over 3. Um, concave up, well, it'll be anything to the right of that. So you could say x is bigger than a third. If you prefer interval notation, you could say x is bigger than a third, and that would go up to infinity. Now, if you did not have the graph in front of you, then how would you be able to do this? Well, what you would do is you would say that the second derivative is positive or happy. Remember, when you have concave up, your second derivative is a positive number, so it's bigger than zero. And when you have concave down, your graph is sad, negative, and so you would say that it is smaller than zero, which is negative. So if you did not have a graph that you could look at, you could just say that you want the second derivative to be bigger than zero. You would then say 6x minus 2 bigger than zero. You would then say 6x is bigger than 2. Divide both sides by 6, and you would end up with x is bigger than a third, which is exactly what we got over there. This question says, determine the maximum, okay, that's an interesting word, okay, maximum, vertical distance between the graph of f and the graph of the first derivative over the following interval. Right, so you've maybe watched some of my videos on this before, but how do you, how do you find the vertical distance between any two graphs? Typically, like in grade 11, um, they would give you a parabola and they would give you a straight line and they would somehow ask you to find the maximum distance between the two. Now, well, what I would normally do in those types of questions is I would always say you need to have the equation of the, of the top, the top one, you see the one, the graph that's on top. And then you need to have the equation of the graph that's at the bottom. And then you would say the top minus the bottom. Have you ever seen something like that of mine before? Well, we're gonna use the same technique here. The only problem I see though, um, is we have the graph of f, but we don't have the first derivative. But it's not a problem. We can quickly go find something here. So if we go take the first derivative, that's gonna give us uh, 3x squared, take away 2x, take away five. This is a parabola. Okay, is it happy or is it sad? What do I mean by that? Is it happy like this or is it sad? Well, it's happy, okay? Because this number in the front, the x squared term is a positive number. Now they've only asked us to look between negative one and zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug minus one into this equation because I'm just trying to get an idea of what the graph looks like, okay? So we're gonna plug minus one into this equation. So that's gonna look like this. And if you had to go work that out, you would actually end up with zero. So that means that when x is minus one, the y value is zero. So that is exactly the same as this graph of m. I mean, this point m, it's exactly the same. Then I'm gonna go plug in the other point um, into this equation. So I'm gonna plug in zero now. And you end up with negative five. So, that, so when the x value is zero, the y value is negative five. So if we go fill that in, it's over here. Okay, now we know it's a happy graph. So we know the shape is probably gonna do something like that, okay? So the point that I'm trying to show though is that if you look between the interval that they are talking about, which is here, who's on top? Is it the cubic or is it the parabola? Well, it's the cubic. We can see that the, um, the cubic is the one that is higher up. For example, if you chose this x value, if you look vertically, who's higher up? It's the cubic. If you chose this point, if you look vertically, who's higher up? It's the cubic. So that means we're gonna say top minus bottom. So it's the cubic equation. So we're gonna say vertical distance is gonna be equal to the top equation, which is x cubed, take away x squared, take away five x, take away three, minus, in brackets, the bottom equation, which is this. So three x squared, um, take away 2x, take away 5. We're now just going to say this as much as possible. So I'm just going to get rid of these brackets. Okay. And now I'm going to just put all the like terms together. So we're going to end up with negative 4x squared. So that's, um, I, put, I put that one and that one together. And then negative 3x, that's by putting that one and that one together. 
and then positive two, that's by putting that and that together. Okay, so there we have the vertical distance. This formula gives us the vertical distance. Now, what are we trying to do, guys? Well, we are trying to work out the maximum vertical distance. Ah, in grade 12 calculus, whenever you wanna find a maximum, for example, on some type of graph, if you wanna find the maximum, how do you do that? You take the first derivative and you make it equal to zero. So we're gonna take the first derivative of this equation. So we could say, um, we could say that we're gonna take the derivative of the vertical distance, you could have called that distance or whatever, and we're gonna do that with respect to x, so dx. Okay, so if we take the first derivative, that'll be three x squared, take away eight x, take away three. We're gonna make that equal to zero. Okay, because that is how you find maximums and minimums. You make the first derivative equal to zero. We're now gonna go solve for x. Okay, so I'm gonna, we've made this equal to zero. I'm gonna use the quadratic formula, okay? Because I don't feel like factorizing that. And if you do that, you end up with x equals to three, or, now it can't be x equals to three because we're only going between negative one and zero. Then the other answer is, here we go, x equals to negative a third. So we cannot use this one because that is outside of the domain that they have asked us to use. But this number is still within the domain. Now that's not the answer, that just says the x value. So that just tells you where about the, the maximum is. So they're saying that x is negative a third, which is probably there. So they're saying that that is where the maximum is. But now, if you actually wanna find the maximum, you can just go plug it into this formula here because that formula gives you the vertical distance. If you want to maybe go plug the x value into this one's equation and plug the x value into this graph's equation and then subtract them, some learners like to do it like that, you can, but I just like to keep it easy and I plug it straight into this formula because this formula is giving us the vertical distance. And so I'm gonna go plug in a vertical, is equal to, now we're gonna say negative a third to the power of three, take away four to the negative a third squared, uh, take away three to the negative a third plus two. And if we go work that all out, we end up with, if we round to two decimal places, 2.52.